So I've made a few jokes about this before, but I'd imagine that most of you didn't think I was being serious when I said that my mom actually watches all of my videos, despite only understanding about 2% of the words that are coming out of my mouth at any given time. So I've decided that, in celebration of Mother's Day, I'd make my next review mom-friendly, meaning that I'll be trying to explain and review the game in a way that a mom could maybe understand, making some jokes that a mom might find funny and keeping the language at a nice PG-rated level. Despite the fact that every trip in my mom's car growing up was essentially an exciting new lesson in GDM 101 and introduction to swearing. I'm also just gonna go ahead and spoil pretty much everything that happens in the story of this game because there's no way in heck my mom's ever going to play this and it's Mother's Day so everyone else can go F themselves. Wow, I already hate this. Anyways, I figured what better game to make mom friendly than Outlast 2, a survival horror game chock full of violence, gore, and anti-religious imagery. That's relatable to a mom, right? Hang on, let me think. I'm sure I can find a way to relate it. In the meantime, I'll just go ahead and start explaining what the game is actually like. Honestly, you'd think that this game would be particularly scary to me, given that it plays off my specific fears of the outdoors being stabbed and being trapped in conversations about Jesus, but family gatherings have all that stuff too, and those are significantly more terrifying to me than everything in this game combined, which either means that I'm a real-life survival horror expert who should be given his own TV show, or that Outlast 2 has some pretty fundamental problems in its design. And now that I've used the term survival horror to describe this game for a third time, time in two minutes, I should probably explain what the heck that actually means. And strap in, because this one's a doozy. A survival horror game is a game in which you are placed in a horrific situation that you must survive. Stay with me, hold all questions until the teacher has finished talking, please. In Outlast, the actual moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, that being the bits where you actually press the buttons to move around and do the things, no, this is not a game where you shoot at the bad guys, is pretty similar to raising a child. It's heavily reliant on trial and error, gets repetitive and annoying very quickly, and you're essentially guaranteed to fail at least once. Now, now, in order for me to explain why this is the absolute worst possible way to design a horror game, let's do a little bit of theater of the mind. Imagine you're sitting in a dark room watching a horror movie, only the movie itself is 8 hours long because every single time the main character dies, the disc skips back to the beginning of the scene and they have to try something slightly different. Now imagine that this can happen up to 10 times in every scene and there are only 3 or 4 ways that the character can actually die. Now tell me. What's scarier about that, the imaginary movie itself or the fact that I just found something that sounds even more boring and unpleasant to sit through than your second child's high school graduation ceremony? See, contrary to what you might think, horror games actually get significantly less scary the more often you get killed in them for a number of different reasons. The first and most obvious being that things are very rarely scary more than once, notable exceptions notwithstanding. So when you get stabbed to death by a psychotic religious zealot with a super spooky southern accent for the 17,000th time, it's kind of hard not to grow numb to it. The second and slightly less immediately obvious reason is the fact that every single death in a horror game is just a reminder of the fact that you're not actually in any kind of danger when you reload the last checkpoint. And in reality, the only thing you need to be scared of is whether or not there was something you could have done to keep your son from dropping out of college in order to pursue a career in entertainment on YouTube. Another reason that Outlast 2 is more annoying than it is scary is the fact that the game's design has a much larger focus on running away from enemies rather than hiding from them. And I have no idea how to make my reasonings to why this isn't scary mom funny, so I'll try to be concise for once in my life. In my opinion, hiding from something is inherently much scarier than running away from it because it takes all sense of control away from the player. When you're being chased by someone, you have several different options available to you at any time that can increase or decrease your chances of survival. But when you're being hunted down, all you can do is sit tight, try not to make any noise, and hope for the best, which I think is way scarier. Unfortunately, even when the game does force you to hide, it's still more frustrating than scary because the enemies intelligence is all the consistency of leftover instant mashed potatoes. Oh, but that's not all the gameplay that Outlast 2 has to offer, no. The running around and occasional forced stealth sections are broken up by puzzles. No, it's not like a jigsaw puzzle. In most video games, a puzzle is sort of like a digital escape room where you're presented with a problem and must use the environment and the mechanics the game provides to you in order to find a solution that will allow you to progress. And no, you can't shoot the puzzles. This is not a game where you shoot at the bad guys. Honestly, I could probably spend a few minutes explaining why the puzzles in Outlast 2 are only as good as my high school GP meaning that the only thing keeping them from being absolutely horrendous is what you have to directly compare them to, but I can already feel this mom-friendly gimmick wearing itself thin, so let's just move on to talking about the story and how that's bad too. Outlast 2 opens with you, Blake, waking up in a helicopter with your wife, Lynn, who is a wife in a survival horror game about religion, so her purpose in the story is only slightly less predictable than the sunrise or an attempt to take a family photo.
Actually, that's all a lie. The game really opens with a static image and some text telling you exactly who these characters are and what they're doing here, which is then immediately followed by the scene in the helicopter where the characters explain to each other exactly who they are and what they're doing here. So give me a moment to explain exactly who these characters are and what they're doing here. You are Blake, the cameraman and assistant to your wife Lynn, an investigative journalist who is looking into the mysterious murder of a woman in rural Arizona. And you're also apparently really terrible at your job because the first thing you record is footage from inside a helicopter with the on-camera microphone. Honestly, without nitpicking, this scene is pretty standard and mostly inoffensive. Just a massive exposition dump in order to set the stage for the rest of the game. But there is this weird moment I want to mention where your glasses fall off your face and your vision gets all blurry, because that would be some kind of clever foreshadowing if it ever had the decency to go anywhere. And try to remember that I said that for like, three minutes because I'm going somewhere with this. Anyways, after the game gets bored of spoon feeding you exposition, the helicopter you and Olga Nipper are riding in crashes, because of course it does, it's a helicopter and this is the opening scene of a video game. You couldn't find a more hostile relationship than that if you gathered a PTA comprised entirely of suburban mothers. What, did you expect a psychological horror game to show some level of restraint? Nah, just do The Shining! It was Spooks McGillicuddy in that movie, surely it'll be even scarier with no tension, build up, or context. After the helicopter crash and Hawaiian punch hallucination, Blake wakes up on a cliffside and the story of Outlast 2 can finally and abruptly begin. Well, I mean, I say it's a story, but in reality it's more a succession of things that happen to Blake until they don't anymore. You look for your wife. Looks like she got taken by a crazy Christian death cult. Oh, you found her. Great. Now just get out of here before- uh she got taken by the pagan death cult that's also here, because of course it is. Well, I guess you better go find her after we remind you that Blake wears glasses. Corn, mines, corn, church, corn, bridge, corn- oh! No, you fell off the bridge, and now you're being hunted down by a midget riding someone who would probably wear Hawaiian shirts if he was born into a normal society. Is this a new faction? Yes, but also no. But also yes, they're sort of a splinter, except maybe they aren't. Now they think you're Jesus, the again version, and they're crucifying you. Oh, you escaped. Oh, they caught you again. Oh, you escaped again. Better raft across this lake. Oh, sorry. Better raft across this haunted lake. Does that come up again? Why would it? Oh, wow, that's odd. I don't remember raining blood being in the forecast. This shirt- Stop. Believe it or not, having a million things happen in your story isn't a sound alternative to writing a story with some actual structure or through line to it. It doesn't matter how much sugar you pour in, if you forget to add the baking soda, your cake isn't going to rise. And the summary of an 8 hour long horror game shouldn't be as chaotic and ADHD to describe as the full history of the entire planet. I honestly don't even know how I'm supposed to critique this story, because it's just things happening for 8 hours. I haven't even mentioned the other recurring thing where you hallucinate that you're back in your Catholic elementary school and find hints about something terrible that happened to your childhood friend Jessica there. And I'd just like to remind you of the fact that the first one of these hallucinations features a Kool-Aid hallway, so try to remember that that's the level of subtlety we're operating on here. I will say though that there's one sort of neat thing that these sections do that I wish had spilled over into the rest of the game a little bit. I realized pretty early on in my playthrough that all of the scares in these sections were scripted events that would never actually kill me, which broke any semblance of tension that the game had in the real world segments and made me entirely entirely complacent in my safety. Then, the second I became completely relaxed during these sections, the game made an actual enemy out of the creepy tongue monster that had appeared a few times before. A creature that's probably some kind of metaphor for something, but it's never really made clear what, so let's just say it's representative of the rampant bureaucracy in American education and move on. The first time I had to actually run from this monster is the only thing in the entire game that really sticks out in my memory because it's the one time the game built up my expectations and then completely shattered them. It was the only thing in my entire playthrough that I didn't see coming, and as a result, it was also the only moment that genuinely scared me, which is probably why it annoyed me so much that the bureaucracy monster then immediately stepped in line and became just another trial and error nuisance after the first scare. Which I think sums up the most danging flaw of Outlast 2 as a horror game. It just isn't scary. And when I say that it isn't scary, please try to remember how I reacted to Harry Potter 3 in the Thriller music video the first time I saw them. Yeah. That's the person telling you that this game isn't scary right now. So I can't recommend it for its gameplay, I can't recommend it for its scares, and I can't even recommend it for its unstructured mess of a story, because in addition to having the structure of a deck built by a dad, none of the 500,000 elements it introduces ever go anywhere. I guess the fact that the glasses thing didn't go anywhere was a clever bit of foreshadowing after all. I'm not kidding, the reveal of what happened to Jessica in the past that's causing these hallucinations is that a bad thing happened to her. It's got nothing to do with anything in what I'd hesitate to call the game's plot, and it doesn't even seem thematically relevant aside from the fact that it happened into Jesus. Oh yeah, you know all the incessant religious messaging and imagery? Yeah, that doesn't ever go anywhere further than 
religion, right? And honestly, I don't even know if you could say it goes there because the game ends when you have to save your wife from both of the cults only for her to give birth to the Antichrist and bring about Armageddon. Which means that the crazy religious fanatics that the game has spent the better part of eight hours condemning were… right? What exactly is the message here, Red Barrel? Don't trust those religious crazies, except do, except don't, except do? All in all, by the time I'd finished Outlast 2, the only fitting description I could think of was that it's a series of red-tinted hot flashes, disgusting visuals, pain, annoyance, and frustration that I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemies. And the only positive thing I felt coming out of it is that I might be able to turn this terrible experience into something good for someone else. Basically, it's the game equivalent of childbirth. Mmm, <laughs> I told you I could relate it at the end! See, I don't believe in God, cause God don't believe in me. No, I don't believe in God, oh no, sir. See, I don't believe in God, cause God don't believe in me. See, I don't believe in God, oh no, sir. It's been a long, hard 19 years since I stumbled onto Earth, holding my metronome in one hand with the other in the dirt. Digging for something like humanity to reconstruct my sanity To the man who looked like sadness told me it was worth the heartache not to try He said my songs are good when I'm 